Greetings in the name of the Lord, my brethren. We rejoice in our assembly once again to give our attention to his word, to ready our hearts on this great, vital, essential, central truth from Scripture, the coming of the Lord. This is the last great event on God's calendar. If you could say that God has a calendar, he's not constrained or restrained by dates or time, place or people. He is moved by his own person. And he is moving in this, in this direction toward the coming of his son for his own name's sake. To honor his son's name. That he would be exalted, that he would be revealed in all his splendor for who he is now, who he was when he was among us, though it was hidden, though it was veiled for a time. It will not be veiled any longer when he's revealed in the clouds with his angels, when he comes in the Father's glory and the glory of the angels and his own glory. We'll give our attention this morning, brethren, to a text from his own words, our Lord's own words in Matthew 24 and 25, if you'd like to turn there. Two statements where the Lord sums what he said to pinpoint our thinking so that there would be no mistake of his point. The topic of our consideration this morning is the necessity of readiness, and that comes right from these words. Well, that's what our Lord's speaking about. This is why we should be ready. <laughs> this is why. God has always been busy revealing to any who would listen what he's doing. God wants us to know what he has planned, not necessarily the details. He very often keeps that to himself. But he wants us to know the direction in which he is heading so that we can join him in that effort, much as Daniel did. When Daniel saw in the rising of Jeremiah that the time was close, when God would restore his people, the 70 years were, were almost completed. And so he began to pray about that matter, that God would fulfill his word. He began to confess that, God, what you have done to this point is right and true, and we can trust in the things that you have brought to be and to bear upon us, even though they're they are very painful, even though they brought great pain upon us. But now, God, fulfill your word. This is what he's praying in Daniel chapter 9. Fulfill your word. Keep your promise, not for our sake, God, but for your sake, for your own name's sake. Nehemiah, some 100 years or so later, probably closer to 120 or 130 years later, the cupbearer of the king, in the Persian government, heard word from Jerusalem that the walls were still broken down, that the fullness of that city had not yet been restored, the place where God put his name. So he began to pray, began to form a plan in his heart and mind, led by his conviction for God's own name, God's own person. And he asked for God's help to join with what God intended to do to reestablish his city, the place where his dwelling was. And he asked for God to give him favor in the eyes of the man to whom he was going to go before and ask permission to return to Jerusalem. Brethren, we may do that as well. We may join with God. We have already. <laughs> I would urge you to continue to do that even as we may see some things being opened now in, in our own generation. Things that God is doing, ways that he is working, continues to work in the hearts of his own people, but also in the hearts and minds of those who do not know him, even as he did in Nebuchadnezzar. We can see his hand busy and at work, if we will, if we have a heart to. The prophet Jeremiah very sadly told his people in that day, and the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, again and again, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear. This was not pleasing to God at all. His co-worker, we don't know whether Jeremiah knew Ezekiel or not, but they were working together, one in Jerusalem and one in Babylon. His co-worker was telling the people there in Babylon, do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked? 
declares the Lord God. He wanted them to listen, to hear, to know, to understand, to see what he was doing in these events and in these circumstances. Him controlling the circumstances, managing them with his hand, not the other way, not simply responding. God was not just standing by and letting things fall out as they may. He himself was working them. Amen. And his prophets urged his people to listen. Listen to God and it will go well with you. Those who had a heart did. That's the point I want to make about us. Has he not, by his son and his spirit, given us a heart? To hear, to know, to listen, to respond. He has. He has. If we will. Amen. These things that have happened in the past, the Apostle Paul wrote, have happened to them as an example. They're written for our instruction. Upon whom the ends of the ages have come. We are in them now. It's coming to pass now. He said in another place, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. That through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. See how all of that looks forward? It looks out and beyond where we're at right now, whatever the circumstance. Whatever may plague us now. Whatever may distract us now. Pull us down, pull us back. Does not matter. We have hope. We are able to look forward. Because of what he has said, what he has promised, and he always keeps his word. He's telling us in what he says that he's doing something now. His word, living and active. His word sent for a particular purpose with power to penetrate and to permeate and to accomplish exactly what he intends, not as man understand. Not as man would know or readily recognize according to the flesh. Not at all. God has his ways. Does he not? Amen. Higher than our ways. And he is calling us up. He's calling us up to his ways. Amen. To hear and to see and to join him in what he is doing by faith. So brethren, I urge you to give attention to his word. That will enable us to fully engage these things that God works in his people, in our hearts and our minds. It'll, it will enable us to interact with him now, by our faith, to join hands with God, and to walk by faith where he's taking us. And we know where that is. It's to his presence. He's taking us to himself. He's bringing us to himself, drawing us there, if you will, by the cords of love, by the cords of his, his very own spirit that abides within us, the spirit of his son that he sent into our hearts by which we respond to him then. See? See how these things work together? So I would urge you by the words of these introduc this introduction to respond by your heart your spirit, your soul, your whole being, all of your strength. Respond. There is no other response, really. There is none other. But that our whole being would offer itself to him as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, made so by him, by his work, his power. Holy and acceptable, proving his own will in ourselves, even as our Lord did, Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle Peter said, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. He's there now. He's working for us now. Amen. Even now as we sit here in this gathering, where his name is honored, he's attentive, he's listening, he's engaged with this gathering and others that may be taking place in other places. Chosen witnesses saw him alive. Our brother Luke wrote, 
and God granted that they would see many convincing proofs that he certainly was alive. They saw him bodily ascend to the fall. He was lifted up while they were looking on, Luke records, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was departing, behold, two men in white, white clothing stood beside them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. This Jesus, the one that they knew, with whom they'd eaten and traveled, to whom they had listened so intently, the one who had, who had broken every one of their hearts at one time or another, but simply by the words that he said, he broke their hearts. And yet, they were drawn to him, so much so that the apostles said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of life. They could not deny the attraction of his words in his own heart. And they loved him. Loved him to death. Their own death. The words of our main text that we'll consider this morning are words that Jesus spoke just days before he died. And they serve to remind us that all the things that took place happened according to God's determined purpose and foreknowledge. They were not an accident. They were not circumstances the Roman government, the religious leaders in Jerusalem did not have control. Just it's striking, just to think of it, how that when they came to arrest him there in the garden, he went out to them, and they ran for cover. And he said, here I am. And then under, in, in full custody, what it appeared to be full custody, Pilate warned and threatened him of his great Roman government responsibility and authority over him. And Jesus put him in his place. So these things are not an accident. Because of that, it, it quickens the awareness of those who have a heart for the promise of his coming. That even as those things occurred according to the determined purpose of God's will, Events continue to happen that way. The details do not matter. Do not matter. God is working all of that by his hand, his wisdom, and his power. Waiting involves watching, expectancy, and preparation. They all work together. They all go hand in hand, supporting and encouraging one another this watching and expectancy and preparation. In the words that we will consider here, mainly from Matthew 24, what we call Matthew 24, Jesus is culminating his reasons for readiness. This passage is a difficult one because the, the disciples have asked him some distinct questions about the destruction of Jerusalem, the signs of his coming, his return. They knew that he, that, he, that he talked about returning. Even before his death. And so they asked him questions like uh, about this. In his answer, he culminated it by saying in verse 44, For this reason you be ready to. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will. It's in verse 3 that they ask the questions of Matthew's record. Mark has a record in Mark 13. Luke does in Luke 21. I'm going to begin about verse 23 to give several of the reasons that Jesus 
gave for readiness. Why it is necessary. The necessity of readiness. And the first one is readiness gives us insight. That's why it's necessary. It gives us insight. And we need that because there will be false claims. He said that there would be, even in his day. Verse 23 of Matthew 24, Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to be misled, or so as to mislead, I'm sorry, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. But I have told you in advance. See, there we have it again. I have told you in advance. Down through the centuries, I, I have no idea how many, we may speak of this later on in the meeting, I have no idea how many have claimed over the years that either they were him and they were here, or they knew who and where he was, and he was here, or is here, or was here, and has gone back again. <laughs> again and again and again, this has happened. False claims. And so we need... Now, now those who have a heart tender for God are sensitive to this. Amen. Are we not? Amen. Someone who stands up and claims to speak in the name of the Lord, well, we want to listen to that. We want to give, give consideration and weigh what they have to say. Jesus knew that we would, and so he told us in advance. He warned us to give us encouragement and, so, and to support us as we dealt with this. Satan, he knows. Now, the only reason he knows it is because God has spoken it. Satan doesn't know what God's will any other way. And sometimes even when he hears God speaking, he doesn't understand what's going on. He heard all the things that Jesus spoke to the apostles. In my own judgment, he had no concept that what he had done was actually a fulfillment of a working of the purpose of God in eternity when he hung his son, when he hung God's son there on the cross. Satan had no idea, in my judgment, that what was going to take place three days later would take place and that he would lose his power. He would lose his throne. But yet when that happened, he simply adjusted his methods a little bit. And he quickly adapted to enact many schemes, all part of the same one, to imitate the truth. The apostles quickly, in several other letters, had, had to deal with this, didn't they? From many different perspectives, they had to deal with claims and counterclaims. The Apostle Paul specifically, there in Thessalonians, first Thessalonians, or second Thessalonians, pardon me, second Thessalonians had to deal with claims already within a generation after Jesus left, had to deal with claims that he has returned, he has returned, and some of the brethren there in Thessalonica were, the, they were dumbstruck. We've been left. What shall be of us? And so the apostle wrote to assure them, to assure them, we need help to stand this kind of testing. And Jesus provides it. He provides it through his ministers, to the apostles, in their words, that we would understand. He aids us by his spirit with insight, the illumination, enlightenment, as is uh, the word that is used several times in Scripture. An enlightenment of our spirit by His Spirit. A union of our spirit with His Spirit so that we may see and understand the things. This is not just a matter of intellect, brethren. Not just a matter of education. It cannot be. How many educated ones down through the generations have rejected the Word of God? How many of those, even in our own generation, who are educated in the word of God, reject it. Even the basic foundation, cornerstone truths of it, they reject it. So this is not simply a matter of education or intellect. We need insight in the inner man. And God provides that by his spirit in our hearts. 
There are other indicators as well. The Apostle John in his letter, his short epistle, 1 John, many, many times says, by this we know. By this, look for these signs in your lives, in your own hearts, in the hearts and lives of one another. See these things. Let no one deceive you with claims this way or that way. By this we know, the apostle said. And Jesus makes it clear in the next few verses there in Matthew 24, beginning at verse 26, that this coming will not be secret. See? How many times over the generations has someone claimed that his coming, he, he came here or there or another place and has returned again. And only a select few saw it and know about it. But we're here to tell you, it will not be secret. He, he says it right here. The apostles repeat it in different words. If therefore they say to you, Behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go forth. Behold, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Amen. How can such a thing be hidden? Does God intend to do? He was hidden the first time he came. Why would God do such a thing? His truth continues to open up more and more and more as the kingdom progresses. So why would God continue to do things in anonymity, undercover? When we're speaking about the return of the Son. The Apostle John heard these words in what we call Revelation 1. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, amen. amen. These clear statements of Scripture, brethren, cannot be made obscure without great effort. <laughs> a resting and a twisting. Again, the Apostle Paul wrote in his second letter to the church in Thessalonica, the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution on those to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. A liar is quick to disturb and quench the hope of his people. Do not let him do that to you. Your readiness, your readiness will give you insight about these claims and others like them. His next reason then, in verse 28, readiness gives us patience. It gives us patience. That's why it's necessary. And that patience is needed because of the passing of time. There's a sense in which time works against us. Of course, God's not constrained by time, place, people, circumstances, events. So all of these things that God is doing, he sees all at once. He works and he manages from outside of time. Time is simply for the earth. This existence for now, now, which is all we have anyway. He warned them in verse 28, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. It seems clear that this gathering occurred there in Jerusalem. Not many years passed, or not many years from then. Those people did not recognize their visitation. And so the Lord removed the kingdom from them, as he said he would. And he's given it to others. And yet the apostles in their in their teaching right from the beginning because the Thessalonian believers this was a part of what the apostles preached to them while they were in Thessalonica there for those few short weeks during the second journey and those brethren latched on to that truth with fervency and would not let go it, it influenced a lot of things all of their thinking it seems at some times that's why the apostle had to address it and say so much about it <laughs> 
they, they were almost to let it, let that truth uh, overshadow everything <laughs> that they had heard. But they misunderstood the need for time to be full, even as it was at Jesus' first coming. See? In the fullness of time, God sent. God uses time in this way. And he's using it now. He's accomplishing certain things in his agenda that he wants finished and completed and fulfilled. We may not know how all of it fits together, but that does not matter. It just doesn't matter to those who walk by faith. And, and yet this, this reality of, of events taking place in time and, and needing to have, needing completeness does not negate the truth of Jesus' immediate return. Amen. For God is able to accomplish whatever needs to be accomplished in a moment of time. 430 years the Hebrews were in Egypt. How long did it take them to get out? One day. Amen. One day. The Apostle Paul, then, there in Thessalonians, talks about the apostasy, the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction. And then he reminds them, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. Now, Paul does not say right there what that is, what the restraining agent is. Apparently, he had told them, and that's why he's able to say, you know, you know. We don't know exactly what he had told them. But he's just pointing out that God is working in time. Do not be deceived, but use this time. Use the time well. Redeem the time, as he said to the church there in the Ephesian letter. Redeem the time. So I would urge you to do that as well, brethren, not to be overcome. Not to be overcome by the time that passes, even as we would see our children grow older, our grandchildren come, our bodies weaken, and become frail. These are of little consequence in the eternal purpose of God. Listen to these next words as Jesus continues there in Matthew 24, 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Now we know, brethren, that God is able to speak about things that may take place centuries, separated by centuries, but he may speak about them as if they are immediately preceding one another or coming from one another. For God speaks outside of time. He does not view things as we do on a timeline, in a chronological order. He is fulfilling his eternal purpose. Apocal events. Separated sometimes by generations. Even as the events of Daniel's first vision there in Daniel 7. Where he saw these things about these great nations. World shaking powers that would come one after another after another. How many lives? How many births and deaths took place during those events? And yet he saw them just like that revealed. One, two, three, four. Well, this is how God speaks, and we would remember that in his word. Amen. Jesus' language there is panoramic in that sense. It views it, views events all at once. So let us not be distracted or discouraged or distraught with the passing of time. One as young as I, it's a difficult thing to say in some sense. With impatience. In the midst of my life with sons that are grown and sons that are still young. And yet it's a moment. 
It is a moment. Conditions surrounding Jesus' coming, whatever they may be, will validate what God has said and what he has done in his Son. He already makes, he has, all through history, God has made a distinction between those who are his and those who are not. So his eye is upon us. His ear, even now, is attentive. He gives attention to the things that are spoken in this place. A record is made in his presence, brethren, because we esteem his name. Time does not, does not diminish this. Amen. Let it not distract you. For God's patience ends. There's a sense in which that's all time is, is God's patience. Even as our earthly days fill up. And our readiness, then, will help us to do what the Lord, or helps, help us to be what our Lord says next that we need to be. In verse 32, Matthew 24. Readiness is necessary because it makes us sensitive. It makes us sensitive. And that is needed because of signs. Signs that God will give. To encourage the hearts of his people. That he is still active. Now learn the parable from the fig tree, our master says. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. I'm reminded of the words of Daniel, of the words that were spoken to Daniel, I should say for the angel at the end of his record many will be purged purified and refined the wicked will act wickedly and none of the wicked will understand but those who have insight will understand mm -hmm. Amen. did not Zechariah and Elizabeth and Simeon Anna, did they not understand? Amen. They did not know the details. Simeon did not know that day that Mary and Joseph would bring the child, but he had been promised and he waited in faith. Amen. And Anna, when she approached that small company there and heard the words of Simeon. Her heart was immediately, she immediately grasped. For they had seen signs, you see. They had seen signs and were able to, to understand what God was doing. It is God's manner to tell his people what he does. Amen. To encourage and challenge their hearts and to engage them in what he's doing. The prophet says, the Lord does nothing but that he tells it to his prophets. And of course, they're called his prophets because they tell it to his people. That's their ministry, their work. So let us also remain aware and watchful, which is the fruit of readiness, <laughs> that we too will see the signs. We would not have him find us sleeping, Amen. but alert and ready. Indeed, because his next reason for readiness is large, vast. We need readiness, or readiness is necessary because it gives confidence. And we need confidence because of the temporary. Because everything around us, even our own tent, degenerates, deteriorates, and passes away. Creation, the environment in which we abide here, and our own bodies. It's, it's God's work. He's doing this to fulfill his purpose. But these things are not eternal. The containers that he makes to hold for a while what he's doing are only for a while. 
But we, a real us, that's inside our tents, we are eternal, the people of God. We are the ones upon whom God has his eye, who fulfill his hope and work and purpose that we would enter into his presence for fellowship and abide there with joy. And so Ian speaks. He speaks his word to tell us of the things that are lasting and the things that are not so that we might discern them ourselves. But we might see and hold lightly the things that we cannot keep as we embrace those which are ours, even our treasure that's been made, made known to us in the gospel Amen. of Christ Jesus that's been made known to us from heaven, that's stored up there for us where we have set our hearts and minds, where our Lord is seated, where he ministers, where he works, where he intercedes in God's presence for us. We'll set our hope there. We'll embrace that treasure there. Amen. Heaven and earth will pass away, he says. But my words shall not pass away. I've already mentioned the words of Isaiah in Isaiah 55. God's word, it accomplishes the work for which he sends it. Achieving holy and righteous aims with an everlasting impact. If that was true of the word in Isaiah's day, how much more true is it of his word concerning the events or the event and the surrounding circumstances of the revelation of his son in fullness, Amen. in fire, in his own glory, for whom he really is. How much more is it true? The Spirit warns us from Hebrews, the 12th chapter, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less shall we escape who turn away from him who warned from heaven? And his voice, this is a reference to the prophet's words now. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised saying, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth but also the heaven. And this expression yet once more denotes the removing of the things which can be shaken as of created things in order that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. This is why we need readiness, for the time is coming when the heavens and the earth shall pass away with a roar and a great fire. Amen. And only the things which pass through the fire shall remain. Amen. And God intends for us to pass through the fire. Amen. And we will because we are ready. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, now we have it. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Amen. So brethren, do nothing to inhibit the full course of his word by faith in your heart. Let it have its way and move in you that which is pleasing and acceptable in his will as he works through his transcendent word in your own heart and mind. His next reason then, readiness, the necessity of readiness, for it prompts obedience, that we would have our hand to the plow and not look back. No distraction, none. There may be things that we must take care of, commitments that we have made on this earth, and we would fulfill them. We'd do nothing that would, that would bring shame to his name. Amen. And yet we would not turn our eyes away from the furrow, from the path that is set for us, that is marked out and laid there for us to follow. He says there in verse 36 of Matthew 24, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. It's such an apt portrayal of the hopeful anticipation that we have. 
as God made himself known to Noah there in a, in, in a day of shadows and, <laughs> when there was very, very little light. And yet by faith he built. By faith he gathered. According to my calculations, Noah began building 20 years before his sons were born. They were born in the 600, or 500, yeah, 500th year. The flood came in the 600th year. He built for 120 years. That's faith when God told him that you and your sons and your sons' wives will go in. And he had no sons yet. Diligently they worked together. 120 years. 6,240 weeks they worked together. I wonder, did anyone ask him? No, what are you building? Why? If they did, they didn't pay attention to his answers. We're not told the details of that. There's no mention of anything like that. No one, his wife, his sons, and their wives. They built, they gathered, they counted, they entered in, and God shut the door. Faith and obedience that comes from that faith makes one ready at a moment's notice, which is what one week is. See, Noah, God told Noah seven days before the flood came that it was coming. One week in 6,240 weeks is a moment's notice. Noah had a moment's notice. But he was ready. Amen. For he'd been obedient. He was not distracted by the things that others were distracted by. The goings on of family and friends. Preparation for life upon the earth. That doesn't mean that we, distract, that we neglect those to whom we've made commitments. Not at all. God works in all of that. That we would raise our children in a godly home. That we would... Provide for the one to whom we have committed ourselves in this life. Certainly and especially if they share faith. But we would not be distracted. So those of that generation, they did not understand it until the flood came and took them all away. And this is the way it will be for those whose lives consist of family and food and drink. That should make us beware in this generation, shouldn't it? Because how many fellowships are built around family, food, and drink? You cannot be obedient. You cannot if you're distracted by such things. They contribute to make us unaware, unable to comprehend the signs, the day signs that God gives for his people to strengthen and encourage us. Those lesser things, they, he has promised. Our Lord has addressed those things as we seek him and his kingdom first. They shall be added. So we would give our attention to his work. Keeping in mind that readiness makes us alert. It makes us alert. And we need that because we do not know when. He's already said that. He says it again. Readiness makes us alert. And we need it because we do not know when. Verse 40 of Matthew 24. Then there shall be two men in the field. One shall be taken. One shall be left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken. One shall be left. Therefore be on the alert. For you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Brethren, we are part of a distinction in humanity. Those who know the Lord and those who do not. Those who look and long for Jesus, we will find our hope fulfilled. Those who look and long for other things will find nothing when he comes. 
All that they had planned. All that they had stored. All that they had treasured. Gone. Taken from them. For they were not alert. When he comes, only the invisible will remain. This is why we look. Those of us who have faith, we look at that which does not appear. For that is what will remain, the apostle says there in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18. We look at that, increasing our grip and our embrace upon it. But those who do not, they even now are, they culture a hunger for things that can't last. More and more, they want those things. They work for those things. They gather them thing, the, those things to themselves, only to lose them. And of course, it really doesn't matter when they lose them. or lose them, they will. The houses will fall flimsy upon a moving foundation, one that will crumble even when the winds and rain of this life fall upon it, let alone the wind of God's glory and the return of his son in the clouds with the angels. Those of us who have faith are alert to all things. These things will not come upon us suddenly as birth pains upon a woman. We are ready for this pain, are we not? We are ready for the passing from this small container into the glory of the sons of God when he is revealed and we are revealed with him rather than the earth waits with us it watches with us Amen. may we be alert and watch with this perspective those who weep as though they did not weep those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice and those who buy as though they did not possess and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it for the form of this world is passing away. Paul writes about his own view of this in Philippians chapter 4. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. That seems to be a very difficult thing for our generation, doesn't it? Living in prosperity in this land. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, of both having abundance and suffering need, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And this especially includes hanging on to the world lightly, so that when the time comes, we may release. Amen. If we do not, if we do not hold it lightly, its allures will again entangle us and our love will grow cold. That is a stark warning, a stark warning that we would be alert for we do not know when. The next to the last reason then that I see that he gives in this text in verse 45 of Matthew 24 Readiness is necessary, for it makes a faithful steward. And we must be faithful stewards here because of the world to come. Our stewardship will not end in this world, brethren. For as I've mentioned, we have a treasure. It is stored up there for us in God's presence. It is made known to us in the truth of his Son. Amen. And when he comes in his glory, he'll bring it to us with him and will entrust it to us, even our own possessions. Amen. Those who have been faithful with that which is not their own. Well, we would, we would confess, wouldn't we, that what we have now is not our own. Right. No matter that we've worked for it, that which we have, we will not keep of visible things. So we will be faithful stewards. Our Lord says there in verse 45, Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? 
Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. What are the gifts that our Lord has granted us, brethren? They are vast and varied. Multiplicity of his grace. Granted to our hearts that we may use ministering in one another, even as we do now in such fellowships as this. Speaking the word, caring for one another, encouraging and challenging one another to remain true to God's grace. His own image he's granted us. Forgiveness, love, hope, joy, peace. Those are only a few of his multiplied grace. And he intends for us to multiply them. We have that capacity. He's granted it to us. He knows what each of us are able to handle. And he grants it to us in that measure. He understands better than we. And so we would seek his grace, more of his grace, an increasing measure of it, that we might do that very thing. In taking hold of that. For which he has taken hold of us. In Christ Jesus. The Apostle Peter tells us in 1st 2nd Peter 1.10. Therefore brethren. Be all the more diligent. To make certain. See this is how we do it. This what I'm talking about right now. Being a faithful steward. That's how we make certain. As part of making certain. Of his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. See how the Lord weaves this together? What he grants us now is for later. And what, he's grants, what he will grant us later aids us now. And what he challenges and encourages and implores us to give our hands to is what will get us there and what will at the same time be waiting for us in an overabundant supply when we arrive. More and more. Full salvation revealed to us from his own hand. Those who do not these things, those who neglect them, they shall, even as these stewards were, be judged by their own words. Any who considers their Lord unjust, taking what's not his, they will be judged in that way. Now is the day of salvation, the time of God's favor. Do not receive his grace in vain. We have no other time, faith has no other time but now. Amen. None other but now, though faith extends us outside of time. We have no other time but now. And his grace has appeared now. Bringing salvation. Instructing us to deny ungodliness. Worldly desires. And to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope. Amen. And the appearing and glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Thus do we ready ourselves. Thus are we stewards, faithful stewards, while we wait for him to return. Readiness is necessary because it prompts this preparation. Our last reason, taken from our Lord's parable there, of the virgins. Matthew 25, 10. They were going away to make the purchase. The bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast. And the door was shut. Readiness is necessary because it prompts preparation. And it's needed because the unprepared will not enter. That's right. 
No matter what they know, no matter what they're aware of, did you notice that Jesus, when he tells this parable, he makes no comment about why the five had no extra oil. What did it matter? The point was they weren't ready. Their preparation was not there. They were not aware that time would pass, that certain events might take place, that they, they, they were not sensitive to the fact that some things would delay. But those who had wisdom were ready, sensitive, and prepared. Insight enabled them to realize that time is a factor. He will come, but we do not know the duration or the nature of intervening events. So those with wisdom and insight prepared Amen. for an interim. And it did not affect their readiness. This didn't affect their readiness. Therefore, preparation proved their readiness, while readiness alerted them to prepare. Time was a factor. Because once it passes, the opportunity for preparation also passes. But you see, faith transcends all of that. And faith at the same time helps us to see that we have no time but now, right now. So we prepare. We prepare and we enter in. Remembering that there will always be some mockers who in their mocking, falling after their own lust, will say, where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all continues as it was from the beginning of creation. But many things escape their attention. And nothing of importance escapes the attention of those who are ready and prepared and who believe the word of the Lord that the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And the heavens will pass away with a roar. The elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works shall be burned. God's patience works preparation in us who are alert and faithful. So the necessity of readiness, brethren, is clear from these and many other words of caution. God has raised his standard. It is his son, and it will not change. He has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by him. And he's given proof of this by his resurrection. Mm -hmm. Oh, see, brethren, the cornerstone and the capstone mm -hmm. is our Lord himself when he walked among us and when he laid down his life and took it up again and returned to the Father's presence where he ever ministers for us now, helping us that we, that we would be alert and ready and prepared when he comes and he gives us this word. Watch, watch, for I come again. Thank you, brother.